You ever tried to strike a deal with God? I've done it. You know, you try to strike a deal with God. This is kind of what it sounds like. God, if you will, I will. God, if you will, fill in the blank. I will fill in the blank, right? God, if you'll help me get this job, I'll start going to church again. God, if you will, if you, if you will, please, 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 dear God, I know we haven't talked in a while, but remember me, it's Joey. Please, God, if you will help my parents be asleep when I get home, <laughs> then I promise I will get up early in the morning. I mean, early, I'll get up at 10 a.m. and I'll read the Bible. I'll read the Bible. God, if you'll help me get a good grade on this final, I'll go open up an orphanage. I don't know, right? This, this is what we do. This is what it means to try to strike a deal with God. We've all done that at some point. We've all tried to bargain with God. Even if you're not the praying type, even if you're not religious type, you found yourself doing something like that at some point when there's something you wanted. And here's the assumption. There's a big assumption underneath this that we're making whenever we try to bargain with God. Here's the assumption. This is it. I have something God wants. That's the assumption you're making or else there would be no deal to strike. There'd be no bargain to make. See, the most log logical conclusion is, if this is your line of thinking, is that I have something God wants, then I can trade it in. If I have something God wants, he wants me to read the Bible. He wants me to go to church more. He wants me to give. He wants me to do whatever, right? Then that means I can trade in what God wants for something I want. Religion is always transactional in nature. And this is why you cannot have a relationship with God while playing the religious game. Because relationships aren't transactional. In other words, none of the most meaningful relationships you have in your life are based on what you can get out of those relationships, are they? None of them. In other words, when someone says, hey, how's it going with your kids? You don't respond and go, I don't know. I, you know, I'm not just not getting anything out of that relationship right now. <laughs> you intuitively know it's not a transaction. It's not about what you get out or put in. It's a relationship. And what God wants most isn't something from you. He wants something for you. He wants a relationship with you. And if you play the religious game thinking that you need to earn God's favor by getting more tickets, by earning more tickets, by doing more good and doing less bad, you will inevitably begin to relate to God transactionally. And you will miss out on the richness of a personal relationship with God. Two things can't live side by side. And Jesus told a story, actually, that puts this on display in a really clear way, how playing the religious game will distort and warp your view of God and my view of God. I would love for us to look at this story. It's in Luke chapter 15. I'd love for you to see this. We're gonna look, read a bunch of this today. And so if you don't have a Bible, there's some of the seats around you if you're at one of our campuses right now. So go ahead and grab a Bible. It's page 797, Luke 15, 797 if you're using the Bible and the seats around you. Uh, go to there on your mobile device. Do whatever you need to do. Just get to Luke 15 because we're gonna read a big chunk of this because it's a story that Jesus told. In fact, it's one of the most famous stories that Jesus told but a lot of times, we only tell half the story. And the second half of the story is critically important to what we're talking about today. Luke chapter 15. Look at verse one, because verse one gives the context for why Jesus would even tell the story in the first place. Here it says, Luke 15, one. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Now stop, pause here for a second. One translation right here says, in this verse one, that oftentimes tax collectors and sinners, the worst of the worst, right, notorious sinners, it says that they, quote, drew near to Jesus. They wanted to be close to Jesus. The worst of the worst. And listen, I feel like I just wanna point this out because it's so important to this series. People who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. They liked being around him the people who've made a wreck of their lives, the people who'd stacked up a huge pile of sins, the people who had no tickets to offer. They got nothing. They loved being in Jesus' presence. They drew near to him. And listen, it's not because Jesus just let them live however they wanted, just let them be their true selves. That's not, what, no, Jesus challenged them. Jesus called them up into new ways of living. Jesus told them to turn around to begin to follow him. They were deeply challenged while at the exact same time feeling safe and accepted. 
Guys, I just feel like this should always be the way our church is described. Our church should be described this way, where anyone can come in with all their baggage and regrets and find acceptance and love here, no matter the tickets they do or don't have. Because if it's true that people who were nothing like Jesus actually liked Jesus, if you're one of Jesus' followers, that should be true of you as well. It should be true of me. And it certainly should be true of our church. You know, one of the things that moves me most about our church is that here at our church, we've got women who've had abortions. Sitting next to men, we've got men who've wrecked their marriages. We've got addicts and former addicts. We've got liars and cheaters and strugglers and doubters all sitting right next to people who've also experienced new life and victory, all of those things through Christ. And here's the deal, man. We're all sitting here. We're just trying to all draw near to Jesus. And we've got to be a church. We've got to keep fighting to be a church that anyone and everyone can feel safe enough to be here, to draw near to Jesus together. Because when we're a church, when we are a church that's safe for the broken and the ticketless, that's when we look most like Jesus. And that might be offensive to religious people. At least it was on this day, because look what happens in verse two. This made the Pharisees, they were religious leaders, this made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain. They weren't happy. Complain that he was associating with such, such sinful people, even eating with them. Eating in the first century was a sign of of extension of family, brotherhood. And here we go again. Here we go again. This seems to be a pattern. The ticket earners are not happy that Jesus is associating with ticketless people. So Jesus responds to them. And he responds to them by telling them three different stories with some common themes through the stories. He tells them a story about a sheep that gets lost and then has a shepherd that goes after to rescue the sheep. And then he tells them a story about a woman who lost a really valuable coin and then she goes and searches her home to find the coin. And then lastly, he tells them a story about two brothers who are lost. And in this third story, Jesus is about to reveal something about the character and nature of God and how warped and distorted our view of God will become if we play the religious game. Look at verse 11. So we're just gonna, we're gonna work through the third story today. Verse 11. It says, to illustrate the point further, because remember, Jesus is responding to the religious people. That's why he's telling this story. He told them this story. He said, a man had two sons. How many? Two. two. Kind of important to remember that. The man had two sons. And the younger son told his father, I, I want my share of your estate Now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Now just stop for a second. The father has two sons living at home and the younger is done with the father. Done. He's had enough. He wants out. He wants out from under the father's watch. He wants out from under the father's lifestyle. He wants complete autonomy from the father. And so he asked the father for his share of the inheritance. Now let me ask you a question. When is an inheritance typically given? course, when someone dies. So what's the son saying to the father? I want you dead. I wish you were dead. And yet his father loves him so much and gives him what he asked for. Let's keep going. A few days later, the younger son packed up all of his belongings. He moved to a distant land. So he took all the things that his father gave him. He moves away. And there he wasted all of his money in wild living. About that time, his money, about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. This son has now lost everything. Everything, he's lost it all. He's wasted it all. And he is stuck now tending pigs, so poor that he's eating the food that the pigs eat. And pigs were considered, in Jewish culture, pigs were considered an unclean animal. And here's the point. This son is now, at this point in the story, is now totally and utterly alienated and separated from his father and his father's ways. 
You could not get more estranged and distant from the Father than he is at this moment. And he knows it, because look what happens. It says, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, what am I doing here? At home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I know what I'll do. I'll go home. I'll go home to my father, and I'll say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as your hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, which means his father was watching for him, filled with love and compassion. His father ran to his son, embraced him, kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. He can't even finish his apology speech because his dad cuts him off. But his father said to the servants, Quick! Bring the finest robe in the house, put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. My boy, is, my boy is back and kill the calf that we have been fattening. Bad day for the cow. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. It is time for a barbecue. This is proof, by the way, that God is not a vegetarian. Just saying. <laughs> And don't at me, because some of my closest family members are vegetarian, and I pray for them every day. <laughs> it's obvious, man, as Jesus is telling the story that the Father is representative of God. Jesus wants us, and he wanted those religious people that day around him to understand the heart of our heavenly Father, filled with love and compassion for the one who left home yet returned humble and broken. And this compassionate, loving father pours out grace on his son. He pours it out. He ran to him. He robed him and gave him honor. He gave him a ring with his father's signet on it, saying, he's mine. In other words, this is, he's my boy. I claim him. He gave him shoes for his feet to distinguish him from the hired hands. Now, listen, if this were a movie, if we were making this into a movie, this is where the closing credits would start to roll, right here. End of scene, movie's done, the younger son who was lost has come home, the father who is gracious beyond measure has been re reunited with his son, but that's not where the story ends. The credits don't roll here. Because remember, there were two brothers. So what was the other brother doing? Look at verse 20. 25, it says, meanwhile, the older son, he was out in the fields working. And when he returned home, he heard music and dancing. I don't know how you hear dancing, but man, they were having a party. <laughs> he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. The servant said, your, your brother's back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We're celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry. And he wouldn't go in. So his father came out and begged him. The older brother was angry. Angry at who? The father. So the father now has to run out a second time to bring home one of his sons. How embarrassing to the father to have to leave his celebration in order to go appease this older brother. And yet again, look how compassionate he is. He pleads with him. He begs him, come back in, come in, come back home. But the older brother was having none of it. And what the older brother says next to the father reveals his heart and reveals how religion will completely distort your view and my view of God. Look what he says. But the older son replied, the older brother replied, all these years of what? I've slaved for you. I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing that you told me to. And in all that time, you never even gave me one young goat 
for a feast with my friends. And then when this son of yours, he can't even say my brother, when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf? This is the greatest day of this loving father's life. And the only thing on the older brother's mind is a goat. The older brother says, I didn't leave. I never left home. I did it right. I kept all the rules. I didn't do all that stuff. I never did any of that. I've always stayed here. I've been slaving away for you. And you haven't even given, given me a goat. You know what he's saying to the father? You owe me. You owe me. Why? Because I did it right. I've done it right. And I've tried to earn and work. You owe me. See, this response of the older brother reveals something so critically important about what religion will do to us. You see, he stayed close to the father, didn't he? He never left home. He's, he worked for the father, but now we know why. He didn't stay close because he loved the father. He stayed close because he wanted the father's stuff just as much as the younger brother did. But while the younger brother was just outright with it and then he went and lost it all, the older son tried to get it all by slaving away. It was all transaction. Never relational. It was all to strike a deal. And this story ends with only one son who's not at the party, and it's not the one who did all the bad stuff. He's home. He's forgiven. He's experienced grace. The only one who's not in the party is the one, is the one who, from all outward appearances, did all the right stuff but for all the wrong reasons. And those religious leaders that day, as they hear Jesus telling the story, they know now exactly why Jesus didn't end that story with the first son. Jesus is talking to them. Jesus is saying, look, there, there's two ways of being alienated from the father. One way you will alienate yourself from the father is to take all the stuff and leave and rebel. Yep, that'll separate you. But the other way is to stay home, but your heart be far from the Father because you never really wanted the Father. You just wanted his stuff. And you just thought you could get it by earning it. You can be alienated from God through rebellion. And you can be alienated through religion. Because all of the stuff you do for God isn't out of love. It's simply to get something in return. So here's two signs from this story that you might be falling into playing the religious game that we should probably pay attention to from the older brother. Two, two little cues. First is this, religious people do out of duty. Anything they do for God, it's out of duty. It's a sense of obligation. I have to, not I want to, not I get to, I have to. Religious people do out of duty. When I was in college, uh, I needed to lift my GPA pretty much all nine years of college. <laughs> That's actually a joke. It was five. But <laughs> and at one point, I needed to lift my GPA. And so I needed a, a class. So I did, I needed an A in a class. So I did what maybe many of you did when you were in college. I took music appreciation. <laughs> yeah. And I was given, the first day of class, I was given these CDs that had Beethoven, all these pieces, you know, from Beethoven and Mozart and Bach and, I mean, just all these beautiful pieces. And I had to listen to these pieces of music in order to hear all the subtleties and all the nuances, you know, of the composer so that I could identify them just by hearing a little, you know, a couple of bars or whatever. And I listened to these pieces again and again and again, mindlessly hitting the play button on that CD player. You don't know what CDs are. They little circle things that you get scratched and you hate them after they get scratched. Anyways, I'd put them in there and I'd hit the button mindlessly again and again and again. Why? Well, here's what I can tell you. I can tell you why it wasn't. I can tell you it had nothing to do with appreciating the music. It's because I wanted an A. That's how it works. I listen, I work, I put in the time, I get the A. 
That's where religion will always lead you. It's all just a checklist that you do out of duty. It has nothing to do with appreciating and responding to your loving heavenly father who gave it all for you. Read the Bible, check. Pray in the morning, check. Give, check. Serve, check. You show up, you clock in, you pay your dues you, in order to get some tickets, but none of it's out of joy and freedom. It's because you feel like you have to. This is how the game works. You pay your dues and in return, you get God to do stuff for you. Guys, this is why some of us here today have grown so bored with it all. That's so boring to just do a checklist. That's never what God intended. I don't blame you if you're bored with it all if you think that's how God, what God wants. It's not a, that's not a relationship. That's a job. Religious people always do out of duty. Here's the second little thing I think we learned from this story. Religious people get angry when the transaction doesn't work. Angry at who? Angry at God, for one. When the transaction doesn't work the way that you thought the, the, the deal didn't get you know, played out like you thought the deal was gonna get played out. I started going back to church, God. And my marriage still hasn't changed. You didn't come through on your end of the deal. I had something you wanted. I did it. I got baptized. I'm still struggling. I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, God, and nothing happened. Sometimes you get angry at yourself. If you play the religious game, why? Because you make promises and fail to keep them, or you make commitments you don't follow through. And listen, here's why you get angry at yourself. If your motivation is to get something from the Father, you'll hate yourself when you mess up. You know why? Because when you mess up, you'll think that you put what you wanted from the Father at risk now. Older brothers find themselves angry and bitter because they're attempting to control their life, and these are the rules you play by. I work for you, you give me more than a goat. So can I just ask you, has it all become duty for you? Just a job you gotta do. Have you found yourself angry because the transaction hasn't worked? And Jesus concludes this story by telling us about the father's response. And the response of the father is such good news for any of us who are here right now who've been burned, burned out, and bored with playing the religious game. Look how the father responds to the oldest son, the older brother. His father said to him, look, dear son, and remember that, my dear son, you've always stayed by me. He's saying, I noticed. I'm grateful. You've always been here. And everything I have is already yours. But we had to celebrate this happy day. For your brother was dead. He's come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. Man, just look again how compassionate and gracious the father is to the older brother. I mean, think about what the father does. The father ran out to him too, didn't he? The father begged him to come back in. I want you in. And then the father reminded him of what was already true. How does the father address the religious son who won't come in? Do you remember what he called him? The very first thing. My dear son. The father should have kicked this son out of the family. He embarrassed the father. He stood him up. He shamed the father in front of all his guests. But no, he runs out to him too. And he reminds him of things. You are my son. You're my child. You're not a hired hand who has to slave away for my love and my approval. And I'm your father. I'm not a taskmaster. I'm not a ticket taker. I want you to know me, God is saying, as your heavenly father, you are my dearly loved child. Somebody needs to hear that today. You are his dearly loved child. Not because of anything you've done, but because of what Jesus has done for you. You see, there's one other nuance in this story that I just want to point out. 
You know, in the first story, I told you there were three stories in Luke 15 that Jesus told. We only looked at the third. In the first story, Jesus told, the shepherd went out searching for the lost sheep. In the second story, Jesus told, the woman went searching for the lost coin. But who went out searching for the younger brother when he ran away? Nobody. You know why? Because in the first century, if the family had someone who was missing, who had gone missing, do you know whose responsibility it was to go searching for that family member? The oldest brother. But he never did. And underneath this story, Jesus wants us to see something. Jesus is saying, I will do for you what the older brother refused to do. Jesus is the older brother that you and I need most. Jesus enters into the dark and distant land of our world, of our lives, comes searching for us to bring us home, back to the Father. The work's been done. The work has been done. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul is getting at when he said this to the, in his letter to the Christians living in Ephesus. He said this, now all of us, how many? How many? Who? All. All of us, all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what you've done? No, because of what Christ has done for us. Jesus does the work and earns our rights as children because we can't earn it. You can keep trying to slave away for God. You've already got all of his love. All we need to do is stop striving for the Father's love and approval and favor and simply rest in what Jesus has done for us. You know, this story, it ends unresolved. That, that last sentence we just read, that's how the story ends. Jesus moves on, goes and grabs lunch or something. The story ends there. It doesn't have any resolution. Does the older brother go in? Don't know. Does he receive the grace that his father offers? Don't know. Does he finally start to relate to the father out of love, not duty? We don't know. And I think Jesus leaves it open-ended because he wants us to see ourselves in the story. What about you? Are you just doing for God out of duty? Have you seen God as transactional to be bargained with and lost a sense of relationship? with your heavenly father who says, you're my child. And if you're burned out or bored with playing the religious game, man, my deepest prayer for you is that you lose your religion and come into the house where the party is happening instead of staying out in the fields trying to work for God's love. You've already got it. And if you've settled into playing the religious game, I just want you to hear these last words that the father spoke to his son speak to you. He says to you today, my dear son, to you, my dear daughter, you've been going through the motions. It's all been out of duty. But what I have for you isn't a transaction. You're my child. All I have is already yours. All my love. So stop striving today. Stop striving today. You could never earn what's already been freely given to you. And he says, I've already freely given you all my love. Jesus Christ proved that. So come back in and rest in my love as your heavenly father.